Well, hello, beautiful church. How are you today? I'm glad you tuned in. My name is Joe Savino. I'm the pastor at the uh, Wenatchee Seventh-day Adventist Church in Wenatchee, Washington. And uh, we are going to enjoy uh, some time in God's Word together today. Uh, I am continuing a new series that I just began last week that I have called Jesus Upside Down Teachings. And uh, this week's message is called The First and the Last. My main passage for today is Matthew 23, 1 through 12. Uh, why don't we just pause and have a word of prayer? Lord in heaven, thank you so much for bringing us together today. I pray that you'll bless this time, that your spirit will teach us important truths that we need to either know or be reminded of, that we might uh, walk more closely with you and honor you in our lives. And we thank you for these things and pray them in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week we uh, introduced the, uh, the upside-down teachings of Jesus, like I mentioned to you, the teachings of Jesus that just don't make sense to most people because they seem upside-down, they seem backward, right? Now today we're going to continue that theme by focusing on Jesus' crazy teaching on how the last uh, shall be first and the first shall be last. I, I want to just begin with a story. Uh, Jim and Sue married and became sharecroppers. If you don't know what that, that is, that, that means they would rent farms and then they would work those farms for a percentage of the income uh, from the crops. All right. So one of the ways that uh, Jim subsidized his income, because that wasn't really enough to live off of, so he subsidized his income by milking cows. And he had about a dozen cows out in the barn. Well, one day, a salesman came to the farm, and uh, he wanted to show Jim this new device that was called a milking machine. Instead of milking by hand, see, these marvelous new contraptions would fit right onto the, uh, uh, the cow's udder, and then when you turned it on, it, it'd milk the cow for you, which was a, an amazing invention back then. Well, the salesman made his pitch. He explained it all he could, and then he asked Jim if he, if he could show him how, how it worked. Well, Jim said, you can use it on any cow in the barn except... Old Bessie, she's at the very end of the, li uh, the line, down at the end. And Bessie was a mean and temperamental cow. And uh, she would viciously kick you if, if, you know, if you got her mad. Really, said the salesman to, uh, to Jim, obviously thinking Jim was too young to really know anything about real farming. And with an attitude that implied, you're just a kid, you don't have a clue, that salesman proceeded to take his machine down to Bessie's stall. And as Jim told the story, he said, it went like this. He said, I thought for a moment that he was going to get it done. He got three of those four cups on Bessie, and she stood there without moving a bit. But something must have gone wrong as he put, tried to put that last suction cup on her because Bessie went berserk. She bucked and she kicked and she kicked caught that salesman with one of her hooves and kicked him all the way across the aisle. So Jim ran over and he found the man was bleeding, but uh, he was still alive. And so he called up to the house for Sue to come and bandage the man up. And as she fixed him up, Jim now had a new problem. He had to decide what to do. Can you imagine what problem Jim now had? That's right. That milking machine was still hooked on to old Bessie, and she was in no mood to have anyone in the stall with her. But he finally got the machine off of her. I don't know how, but that's not germane here. But he got it off of Bessie, and he put it in the car for the, for the salesman, and then he helped that man, that bandaged-up man, over to his car. Well, that salesman got in, and he left without saying a word. I mean, he never thanked him. He never made an apology. He just drove away. Now, what was that salesman's problem? I'll tell you what I think it was. I think his problem was that he didn't want to listen to a young farm boy tell him his business, right? He thought he knew everything there was to know uh, about cows, and he was going to show Jim what it was all about. That salesman 
was a proud man. Proverbs 16, 18 tells us that pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. And that's exactly, you know, what happened to that salesman, isn't it? Here in our text this morning in Matthew 23, we're going to look at a lot of verses today, but uh, Matthew 23 is, you know, a home base for us. But here we, we, we have Jesus warning the crowds about being proud. And he used the Pharisees and the teachers of the law as his examples of what pride looks like. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you see, were always looking to be at the head of the line. Uh, if there was a place of honor at the head of the table, they expected to be the one sitting there. Uh, if there was a title that they they felt that they had earned, well, you better give them their proper respect by using that title. If there was praise to be received, well, they wanted some of that. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were proud men. And because they were proud men, they expected to be honored by position and power that revealed itself at the head of the line. Jesus was never impressed by these guys, never. And he picked on them every chance he got because they were proud men and he had to teach them and everyone looking at them about pride and what it does. James 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. In preparation for today's message, I did a study on the words proud and pride in Scripture. And I have to admit that I was surprised at what I found. And as I did my study, I began to realize just why, just why God opposes the proud. So let me share a few of these passages that I found that helped me to understand the reason why God opposes the proud. First of all, in Leviticus 26, 18 and 19, God says, if after all this, that means all of his pleading with the children of Israel, you know, because they kept coming in and out of their relationship with him, right? They go chase little tangents and shiny things all over the place, even if they were pagan gods or, or uh, ways of life that God didn't agree with. God had instruct them, instructed them otherwise or whatever it was. God was constantly pleading with his children. And so uh, now we understand why he is now saying, if after all this... You will not listen to me. I will punish you for your sins seven times over. Remember, God, if, if God is punishing someone, he is trying to teach them a lesson. It's not like he's an angry God, you know, that's just looking for any chance to fry people, right? So he says, I, I'm really going to teach you a lesson. That's what he's saying. I will break down your stubborn pride. So he has now addressed what the problem was. Their stubborn pride was getting in the way of their relationship and their dependence upon him. So pride makes it, seems to make it, so that we don't listen to God. That's what that verse just said. In fact, over in Psalm 10, 4, we're told that in his pride, the wicked does not seek him. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. So pride makes it so there's no room for for God in our lives, you see? And then go over to uh, Deuteronomy 8, 14. That warns the Israelites that if they left their hearts, uh, if they let their hearts become proud, uh, he said, you will forget the Lord your God, who, by the way, brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You'll, you'll forget what God has done for you, the one who can help you now. Right? So pride can make it so that we forget God. James 4, 4 through 8 actually takes it a, a step further. Pride appears to make me a friend of the world and an enemy of God. Look what it says. You adulterous people, says James. Don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes, uh-oh, an enemy of God. Or, he said, do you think Scripture says without reason that the spirit he caused to live in us envies intensely? In other words, do you think that the, the, the spirit's jealous for your attention uh, for no reason at all? Right? And then he says, but he gives us more grace. In other words, God is a merciful God. He's a graceful God. 
And then he goes back to it and he says, that's why Scripture says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. God doesn't force himself on us, in other words, right? See, pride tends to make us seek the friendship of the world. Pride seeks the applause of, of the crowd. Pride seeks uh, the position. It seeks the prominence and the power that this world can give us. Pride lies at the heart of wanting to be a friend of the world and of receiving its praises and the Bible explains how that, therefore, makes me an enemy of God. So I don't want to be a proud person. I don't want to uh, forget him. I don't want to end up as his enemy. I want to listen to God. I want to make room for him in my life. So how do I avoid becoming proud like that? Well, we can learn from the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Somebody once said that everyone is an example for us, whether they mean to be or not. Some are good examples and some are bad examples, but they're all examples. These guys were bad examples. In their pride, they did what they did to get noticed. And when they gave money, they wanted you to know how much they had sacrificed. And when they prayed, they, they made sure that you knew how much they were praying. They'd go to the, to the prayer walls, right, out in public, and they'd make sure everybody saw them praying in their own special way. And when they fasted, they wanted you to understand, uh, you know, how they suffered when they missed all of those meals, right? It, none, none of it was in secret. They did all of that for earthly recognition to get the applause of the world around them. They wanted people to marvel at them, to be in wonder at their righteousness. But in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus warned us uh, that our giving should be in secret. For instance, in Matthew 6, 4, just after telling them to give uh, what we give in secret, Matthew 6, 4, uh, he says, Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Uh, in, in Matthew 6, 6, he taught that when you prayed, you should go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And in Matthew 6, 18, he told us that when you fast, you should do that so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. You see, who cares about what the people around you think? The, the, the issue here is that your Father sees you. Because it's only about your Father seeing you. It's only about the attention of the Father. It's only about the affection of the Father. It's only about the recognition of the Father, you see. You know, it's unfortunate that when people hear this word piety they automatically think the worst. You know, that's a pious individual, right? Uh, he's so filled, full of piety. They, they probably think the worst because we talk a lot about false piety, don't we? Which is indeed a bad thing. I looked it up and found two definitions for piety. And here they are. The one is the quality of being religious or reverent. I don't see anything too bad about that. And secondly, a belief or point of view that is accepted with unthinking conventional reverence. How can that be? How can that be a problem, you know? Synonyms, I looked up synonyms for piety, and two of them are devoutness and devotion. See, there's nothing wrong with being pious. The lesson here in all of this is that Christian piety should not be something we do for show. That's where the difference is. That's, that's what proud people do. We should be serious about our giving. We should be serious about our praying. We should be serious about our fasting. But we should almost be secretive about it, according to what we just read. Because it's God's friendship and God's attention we want, not the world's. 
But proud folks don't think like that. You know, they need to be noticed uh, by the people that they can see. You know, they need to see that uh, recognition and that acceptance and that attendance, uh, attention. They need to push themselves to the front of the line. They need to compete for the best seats at the table, right? They need to boast over their accomplishment, accomplishments and all their, their titles. Jesus, though, said it doesn't work that way in his kingdom. If you want to get to the head of the line in his kingdom, you need to go to the back of the line. Matthew 20, verse 16 says that in his kingdom, the last will be first and the first will be last. Now, that makes no sense to the people of this world. How could you possibly get to the front of the line if you insist on going to the back all the time, right? It's one of those upside-down teachings of Jesus. Well, James tells us why. In James 4.10, he answers that question. He says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. See, in other words, if God wants you at the head of the line, he'll put you there. It won't matter where you're standing in the line when he does it. It won't matter how long you've been standing in the line. If you humble yourself, God promises he will exalt you. He'll put you where he wants you to be. The proud don't think that way. The proud don't want God to do all the heavy lifting. You know, they, they'll do it themselves, thank you very much. They adhere to the proverb that we've all heard, God helps those who help themselves, which they'd like you to think is in the Bible somewhere. It isn't. It's a pagan teaching and is one of the devil's best strategies in promoting humanism. I think Ben Franklin is credited with having said it. I don't know if it originated with him. But the absolute truth is God doesn't help those who help themselves. God helps those who humble themselves for his sake. He helps those who submit themselves to his will. Over and over again, he's telling us how to succeed. Look at uh, Psalm 40, verse 8. I like how the New Living Translation uh, shares it. David writes there, I take joy in doing your will, my God, for your instructions are written on my heart. See, he helps those who come near to him and who seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Okay, so now we know. Now we know. Well, now, you'd think that since this is such a basic teaching uh, of Jesus, that Christians would automatically seek to humble themselves so that God could then lift them up, right? But do they? By and large, I'd say no. And why not? It's pretty simple in my mind. It's because we're part of the world. We're influenced by the world. We, we think like the world. And thus, we can fall into that trap of imitating the ways of the world. Don't we? That was the problem with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. The first were always first. And the last were always last. And that's the way it's going to be for them all day long. Jesus warns us to avoid that kind of prideful hierarchy. And he even warns us uh, against one of the ways uh, that that kind of pride sneaks up on people. It sneaks up in the form of what we'll call titles. Titles. Matthew 23, 8 to 10. Look at this. He says something very intriguing that we've passed over. Uh, you know, many of us have just passed over uh, in our reading, he says, You are not to be called rabbi, for you have only one master, and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called teacher, for you have one teacher, the Christ. Skip the titles, he says. But why shouldn't, shouldn't we use titles? Well, one reason is titles, they were having a pr real problem with this. Maybe we don't have a problem. Maybe other people wouldn't have a problem. But they were really struggling with it at the time. And Jesus had to teach them about this. So one reason is that titles tended to set that group apart from others in the church. You know, they, ha they happened to be struggling with this issue. 
Notice what Jesus says there in verse 10. He said, you are not to be called rabbi. Why? For you are all brothers. One of you isn't better than the other. One of you shouldn't be more highly uh, esteemed than the other. You're all brothers. Taking the title of rabbi in this new faith that came to be called the way, those who followed Christ, uh, the early church came to be called the way, you know, so, so, so taking that title of rabbi in this new faith would diminish their relationship as brothers and sisters, you see. It would tend to elevate one believer above the other believers in the church. And Jesus, from the outset in this new faith community, wanted to get things straight. He wanted to have them understand they were all brothers. That's one reason that uh, in, the, in the Adventist faith, uh, though there are some titles, we don't get hung up on certain titles that demand unreasonable uh, levels of respect. All right? I'm familiar with only three titles uh, that we use for our church leaders in Adventist faith, and they all reflect an image of service. They are minister, pastor, and elder, right? Those of you who've been around for a while, those are the main titles that we've ever used. We don't use titles like father or reverend. You know what reverend means? It means to hold in awe or to revere. <laughs> Do you folks revere me? Do you hold me in awe? Of course not. You do not. <laughs> uh, at least I can't see if you do. <laughs> no, the only time the word reverend shows up in Scripture is once, and it's in Psalm 111, verse 9, and it's only in the King James Version where it says, holy and reverend is God's name. Not any human being's name, but God's name. In fact, if you look at that same verse in the uh, NIV, the New International Version, it uses the word awesome. Where reverend is, it uses the word awesome. Hey, you could call me that. You could, you could greet me with, greetings, your awesomeness. No, your, your spiritual leaders here prefer that you not hold any of us in awe because awe is something we'd like to reserve only for God which is scriptural. About the closest term that we have to, you know, holding someone in awe is elder, right? But, but the biblical intent of that word is not what some might think. It is simply a member whose devotion to God and whose Christian walk and wisdom in the view of the people makes that person able to help them in their spiritual growth and direction of the church. Now, that's not describing authority. It's describing service and support. And in Scripture, the term pastor, that refers not to the preacher. It refers more to the elders of the church. The pastor is one of the elders of the church. And while I might do some of the work of an elder, and my, I certainly do, but my job description is actually a little different than that of the local elder in that I am sustained by the church to, to be able to serve it full time, right? Through leadership and administration. Someone's got to handle the day-to-day -day administration and, and, and lead the people. And so that's the role that I have as pastor, but I'm really just an elder. Uh, that's why they call me Elder Joe Savino. The, the older folks would use that title, right? People often ask, in fact, someone did just a couple of weeks ago, what do we call Joe? <laughs> they didn't know if they were referring to me properly or whatever. What do we call Joe? Well, what do you call me? Joe works. I mean, it, Joe works. I mean, I mean, Pastor Joe is endearing and it's respectful and it does make me feel special, I, I confess, but I don't need a title. If you can't figure out that I'm the, I'm the preacher by the end of this sermon, I'm not doing my job right, you know. But there are churches actually where titles can be very, actually extremely important to their leaders. One church I know of insists that uh, their paid staff all be called uh, pastor. If you're, if you're paid by the church, you're the pastor of something, you know. Uh, the preacher is called pastor. Their youth leader is called pastor. Their music director is called pastor. All the paid staff are pastors, pastors of custodial, pastor of uh, uh, administration, all of them, pastor of finance, right? 
All of them are pastors, and if you attend that church, you're required to use that title when addressing them as leaders. Why? Years ago, this question came up when I was visiting with a man who had a business background, and he told me, he said, Joe, it undermines your authority if you don't have the title and expect people to use it. It undermines your authority. Really. Now, I have to confess that there have been a few times, just a few, when, when I've felt the need to remind someone just who they're talking to that way. <laughs> I have. But I shouldn't be looking for that kind of respect by my title alone. Dr. John Maxwell is an expert on leadership. He used to pastor a mega church a few miles from mine uh, years ago uh, in San Diego. And John is known now uh, for teaching about what he calls the five levels of leadership. He is a, he is a, a motivational speaker on leadership, and he's just an expert on this. And uh, these five levels that he has been teaching for many years about for leadership are position, permission, production, people development, and pinnacle. The pinnacle, of course, is the, the highest uh, level of respect that you can earn. Each of these levels are stair steps to a better level. And with each level comes a higher degree of respect. Now, can you guess which of these levels a title would be at? Yeah, the first level, the very first level. The basic level of respect comes with your title. And John says, uh, John Maxwell says that there are leaders who spend their entire career at this first level. They are obeyed, they are followed, they, or they're permitted to lead based solely on their title, on their position. And many of these guys are happy with that. They're, they're just pleased as punch. But how happy are their subordinates? How ha happy are their co-workers? who respect them only because of their title. Well, we won't go through all five of these, uh, these levels, but suffice it to say that climbing those stairs only happens, and you, you should want to climb the, those stairs, uh, but it only happens as your focus on serving people grows. You see, if you, if you pause this uh, video, you can read all of the, the, the you know, sub words there, and uh, they explain. Uh, the better you get at serving people, uh, the more respected you'll become. Real respect from others genuinely comes as you better develop your skills as a servant. Matthew 23, 11, uh, Jesus said, The greatest among you will be your servant. I guess God knew what he was talking about. And we're just figuring it out recently, right? About how... Becoming a better servant uh, makes you the greatest, right? So if I really want to be a person of influence in God's church, if I want to be a great leader for Christ, then I need to become a great servant. And generally, servants don't rely on titles. They rely on towels <laughs> and uh, brooms and uh, mops, you know. They lead from the middle of the pack, that's sort of been my mantra, at least a goal of mine, is to lead from the middle of the pack. Be a servant. I remember as, as a young pastor in my first solo church, soon after I got there, uh, the head elder, his name was Pete, and he was a young man who had once, not long before that, uh, belonged to another faith community, a, a different denomination, and that denomination was, and I think still is, fixated on authority. It was all about authority. You do what we tell you and you don't ask questions, right? And so this, this was uh, the way Pete had been, had been raised. But uh, now he be, had become an Adventist. He was really devoted to the Lord and they made him the head elder. Then I came along. Well, now I remember once after church one day uh, how we were all pitching in to set up chairs and tables for potluck right after church. And I watched as uh, someone called over to Pete, and they asked him to help them set up. And he declined, reminding them that, after all, he was the head elder. <laughs> and he meant it. 
because that's what he'd been taught at his last church. Even as a young pastor, I knew that Peter and I needed to have a little talk, you know. Well, those are just some examples of how churches and how church leaders can get caught up in pride. But let's look at everyday life. How, how do you know when you've fallen prey to this kind of uh, pride? Most church members don't compete for titles. Uh, so, so most Christians, uh, for, for most Christians, it can be a little harder to recognize when, when you've got that, the, the, the pride of a Pharisee, you know. But there is a way. There is a way to tell if you've fallen into this sin of self-importance. Uh, there, there is a, a warning signal, we could call it, uh, that, that you're getting too close to becoming God's enemy. What is that symptom? What is that warning sign, you ask? I would call it irritation. Irritation. Have you ever gotten irritated? I have. Something doesn't go the way you think it should, and no one seems to be paying attention to your point of view on the matter, and so you get irritated. Or you feel irritated because you've been slighted or you've been ignored. Think about it. Now, I know this, this, this uh, is being a little bit too general. You know, I'm, I'm throwing a blanket over this whole uh, subject of being irritated and what causes ir people being irritability, you know, and all that. Uh, but think about it. Why would someone be irritated over being ignored? Well, they'd be irritated because they feel they deserve attention. They deserve appreciation. They deserve acknowledgement, and they're not getting it, right? They deserve it, and they're not getting it. It's, it, it is it nice to give those things, attention and, and appreciation and acknowledgement? Yes, it's nice to give those things. Is it nice to receive those things? It's almost better, right? It's almost nicer to receive those things, yes. But some people feel they have a right to those things. And when those things don't come, they get irritated. But servants don't live for the recognition of the world around them. They live for the rec recognition of their master who is anxious to give it to them. You know, Ruth Harms Calkin describes what it means to have a servant's heart in a little poem that she wrote. Uh, she wrote, I want to share it with you. You know, Lord, how I serve you with great emotional fervor in the limelight. You know how eagerly I speak for you at a women's club. You know my genuine enthusiasm at a Bible study. But how would I react, I wonder, if you pointed to a basin of water and asked me to wash the calloused feet of a bent and wrinkled old woman day after day, month after month, in a room where nobody saw and nobody knew? See, if we're looking for the applause of this world, you know what? That's all we'll get. But if we will humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, as the scripture says, then he promises that he will reward us. He will lift us up. I want to close with a story about Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Washington was a renowned black educator from about 100 years ago. Uh, many of you have probably heard of him. Well, shortly after he took over the presidency at uh, Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, he was walking along in an exclusive section of town when he was stopped by a wealthy white woman. And not knowing this famous Mr. Washington by sight, she asked if, if he'd like to earn a few dollars by chopping some wood for her. Well, because he had no pressing business at the, at the moment, Professor Washington smiled and he rolled up his sleeves and he proceeded to do the humble chore that she had requested. And when he was finished, you know, he carried all the logs into the house and he stacked them by the fireplace for her. Well, a little girl in all of this recognized him and later she revealed his identity to this lady. Well, the next morning, that embarrassed woman went to see Mr. Washington in his office at the Institute, and she apologized profusely. And he replied, 
It's perfectly all right, madam. Occasionally I enjoy a little manual labor. Then he said, besides, it's always a delight to do something for a friend. She shook his hand warmly and she assured him that his meek and gracious attitude had endeared him and his, and his work to her heart. And not long after that, that, that lady showed her admiration by persuading some wealthy acquaintances to join her in donating thousands of dollars to the Tuskegee Institute. The last shall be first. Let's pray. Lord in heaven, thank you for teaching us or reminding us of this very important eternal truth that if we want to be at the first of the line, we should be at the last of the line. Father, help us to have a, a servant heart. Help us to think of others first. Help us to know that if we are to be elevated, it should be you that elevates us. That we could be in great trouble if we try to elevate ourselves and put ourselves in a position where we really shouldn't be. Thank you for reminding us that we can be all that we should be if we will humble ourselves and love others like we love you. Thank you for this time we've enjoyed together, and we pray that you will bless us to be faithful in the days ahead. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for joining me today. I hope that you have a great rest of the Sabbath if this is when you're watching it. Otherwise, have a great week and hope to see you next week. God bless you.